All right, guys. So hopefully this microphone is a little bit better and you could hear me at least louder. Uh, I can't speak for the quality necessarily, but as long as I'm coming through clear. Today we are taking uh, a look at trigonometry. And so we are kind of looking back into geometry. And so when we think of tri or uh, a prefix of tri, we think of three and what has three sides, three angles, anything you can think of with geometry, that would be our triangles. So within our triangles, uh, this one in particular is a right triangle. Given that there is a right angle, we have A, B, and C. The two most notable things that we know about right triangles is, one, the Pythagorean theorem, which is just the A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But also, we know about sine, cosine, and tangent. Today, we are going to be looking at sine, cosine, and tangent. Hopefully, you guys kind of remember these, but ultimately, uh, he was set in from the acronym SOKOTOA. where sine was the opposite side over the hypotenuse, cosine was the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, and tangent was the opposite side over the adjacent. So if you had been asked to find, say, the sine, or let's say the cosine of angle B, well, we'd write down that we want the cosine of B and we know that cosine, based on our acronym here, is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So we take a look to find what side is closest to angle B, and that would be BC. We'd have BC, and what is the hypotenuse of this right triangle? That is the side, the longest side opposite the right angle, which is AB. And we'd have our cosine. Now, you may recognize this as our SOKOTOA. You may recognize this as that math that you could only really do on a calculator. But whatever you do remember it as, uh, this is what we are going to be taking a deeper dive into. So before there was sine, cosine, and tangent, we had a grid. This is just your regular uh, graph and on that grid, we had different numbers. So in this case, we're going to have a greatly magnified view as we are actually just going as far as 1. The reason we're going to just 1 is that sine, cosine, and tangent actually originated not from triangles, but from circles. Now, proportions aside, uh, this is what we call a unit circle. That it is understood that the radius of this circle is one unit. The unit doesn't necessarily matter what it is. It could be centimeters, inches, uh, whatever it is. It's just understood that there is one of them. And that is why we have the 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1 for our x-axis and y-axis. Now, of course, within uh, these units, we do have the ex uh, extremely small numbers going from one half, one quarter, etc., etc. But we are mostly going to be looking at this top area here. So, something we need to remember about circles is that a circle's degree, the total degrees that a circle can have is 360. And we're talking about degrees because whenever we have done sine, cosine, and tangent, we work with degrees. Now, we will be introducing a new uh, type of measurement called radians in just a moment. But for now, since I'm sure most of us are uh, more well-versed with degrees, we're going to be doing degrees. So now, it's understood that 
a circle goes around 360 degrees and then it just starts looping back around and around every single time. So if we wanted to take a measure of a just a slice of our circle, then we'd go up and let's say we go up 50 degrees, right? So I'm approximating here, but let's say that just about here is 50 degrees. So something else we know about this particular circle is that if we draw a line from this point to the center of our circle, that's a radius. And that radius must be one unit. Well now, taking a look at that, how, what is that coordinate? Where do we get this particular coordinate from? Well, just like any coordinate on a graph, we have an x and a y value for this coordinate. So we want to know where these actually come from. Now, of course, if we decided to, we can absolutely just go up to this exact point, and if we had a small enough graph with the numbers labeled through, we could just set that this is uh, points 75 or whatever it is that this would be in this very, very small graph. But since we don't have that, we need to understand where our x value comes from and where our y value comes from. So our x value is just going to be going across as such. So if we go straight down from our coordinate, somewhere around here is going to be our x value. And then if we follow along that exact coordinate going upwards, we have a length for our y value. Now that looks very, very close. Uh, that looks like a triangle, doesn't it? Where if we have a line going straight down and straight across, we also get a right angle. So this is actually where our sine and cosine come from. That is because the value uh, the length of our x value here is represented by cosine and the length of our y value here is represented by sine. And you could think of this as if this is our starting angle, which we had as 50, well sine is opposite over hypotenuse and what it, what do you get when you divide by one? Whatever you started with. And cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And again, we'd just be taking this value, cosine, divided by one, and be left with cosine. So here we are saying that our x value is cosine and our y value is sine. So now this is where they come from. Uh, it takes a little bit to kind of understand with that. If you got it right away, excellent. Because now, uh, although we can determine what the x and y value is, we typically rely on a calculator in order to properly get that. But it is possible that uh, given only this information, we could by hand find out cosine and sine. Uh, also to understand is that Whenever we have worked with uh, cosine, sine, etc., uh, with triangles especially, because triangles never can never go past 180 degrees, we've never really worked with these other quadrants of our circle. This is where we actually step into that domain. So what you may think happens is, let's actually step past that domain of 90 right up at the top. And so if we go past 90, let's take uh, just a something really, really close. Let's go with something more like 100. So 100 degrees would be somewhere, let's just say it's just about there. That is our 100 degree mark. And of course, we should be able to draw a line that gives us 100 degrees. So then following along, the distance from our starting point to this line is 100 degrees. When we're working with sine and cosine, it's very specific about the wording because these still stay exactly as it is. Sine is just your y value 
and cosine is your x value. So if we decided to find our y value, which now, since it's really, really close, it'd get exceptionally close to here. And so then if we got our x value, we'd get that somewhere around here. And we could see that a new triangle forms that is not actually within the angle we're looking at. And so that's actually where we are, actu we are able to step past regular triangles and get sine, cosine, tangent of numbers greater than 90. So that was just kind of a bit of old and a bit and putting in something new for it, whether you knew it uh, already or not. So kind of more of a refresher. Keep that in mind as we go forward. But right now, the main topic that I want to make sure gets across is that radians. Degrees and radians are two sides of the same coin. When we have a circle, there are two types of measurements for the entire circle. So we know about our degrees, that if we go around a circle, we have a total of 360 degrees to work with. But as some of you might be catching on right now, another name for going around the entire circle is a perimeter, or in this case, uh, circumference. And I hope you guys remember that the formula for circumference is 2 times pi times the radius, where it can be set in place as diameter times, the, times pi, but it's more regularly shown as 2 times pi times radius, because radius is one of the only values you really need with a circle. Well, thinking to our unit circle, with degrees, it doesn't matter how large the circle is. It will always have 360 degrees. Whether we have a circle that has a radius of uh, 5 or a circle that has a radius of 10, the degrees will always be the same. Circumference, however, varies based on what is given. So in this case, our circumference would end up 2 times 5 times pi. So in this case, we would end up with 10 pi. But for this larger cir circle, we would end up with 20 pi. So that's why we end up looking at our unit circle. Our unit circle just being a base model for our circles that every other circle can be formed from. That's because within each of these, we have a common factor of 2 pi, regardless of what we have as our final perimeter. So looking at our unit circle, where our radius is 1, we have two sides of the same coin. We have degrees, and if our radius is 1, we multiply 2 times 1 times pi to give us a radian of 2 pi as the total. So now, whenever we talk about a certain slice of our circle, well, we could say that we just took a 45 degree slice, or we could say that we took a slice that is pi over 4 radians large. Now, where did I get this number from? Why am I using pi? I'm using pi because of our circumference here. And our circumference basically can get cut into uh, selections for our circle. And so from those selections, we basically take smaller values of 2 pi in order to determine what our slice is. 
Now, I'm hoping that the idea is coming across that we could use circumference or degrees in order to determine our total area, or our total, total circular degree of the circle. But now we just need a way of getting between them. So whenever you are looking to get your radian value, well, you would typically have some value that we are going to call theta. Whether you've seen this before or not, theta is just the typical term, kind of looking like a zero that has a bit of a line through it. That typically just means some degree. It's the most common used term for degree, and we are going to use that here. So we want some radian value, and so from that radian value, all we have to do is take the degree value and multiply it by pi over 180. The reason we get this is that in terms of radians, pi over 180 is actually the equivalent of one degree. And so if this is the equivalent of one degree, we just multiply it by how many degrees there are and we would get our radian value. So if we were to take something like 45 degrees and we wanted the radian value, we would end up taking 45 degrees, multiplying it by pi over 180, and through simplification, we'd be able to cross these out and get that this is equal to pi over 4. And you could do this for any value of a degree going all the way around to 360. But at the point we get to 360, we would end up with just 2 pi. So this is the main point because we will be going between degrees and radians quite often as we talk about sine and cosine, that this is the main portion remembering this particular formula here of how to go between a degree and a radian. I hope it wasn't too confusing starting with the unit circle and the sine and cosine, but Hopefully this kind of brings it together a little bit. I know the slides aren't exactly the greatest for it. And I hope you're enjoying your day. Stay safe and healthy.